And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our guest today, this morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about in-house counsel. Um, this was a topic area that uh, had, had many young lawyers are interested in, uh, in wondering how does, what's it take to become an in-house counsel? Um, what can I expect if I were to go down that path and how do I get there? And a lot of attorneys that have been in firms um, to, were looking for a change of pace and to do something a little bit differently. Uh, and so this morning with us, we have Andrew Lapeacor, I pronounced the last name properly. Um, Lapeacor, that's good. <clears throat> Great. Uh, General Counsel and Secretary at, um, at Rosemore Incorporated here in Baltimore. And we're going to hear from him about um, his sort of work that he does daily and, and um, how he got to work for this corporation. And then we also have Natasha Nazareth. Natasha um, has, uh, has a past history of working as in-house general counsel for a university system. We're going to hear about her background. She's now in private practice as I understand. And then hopefully joining us, uh, we did, we hopefully will have uh, Randy Sargent um, with uh, Blue Cross at Care First. So um, with that, uh, let me just start off and, and uh, kick off with the first question. Um, um, Natasha, if you could tell us about sort of your path that you kind of followed from law school to, you know, your taking a position as in-house counsel and, and how you got there. Um, so my name is Natasha Nazareth. Um, I um, have been in practice for 22 years now. I started out with um, legal aid in North Carolina. I had gone to Duke and um, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and I practiced for about four years uh, in, uh, you know, an, a very, very large statewide nonprofit practice um, representing children and all kinds of issues of access to healthcare, education, and safe homes. Um, I found myself gravitating towards education in particular as a practice um, and special education. And um, unfortunately, life threw me a major curveball, which is what sent me into the role of in-house counsel um, and a, a two-step process. I had a house fire. I decided I could not be um, doing the uh, very emotionally difficult work that I was doing. Um, and um, so I went to one of the uh, campuses of the University of North Carolina system. At the time, it was an affiliate of the system and a state agency. And I took a hybrid position. It was a risk, but I knew that their general counsel position would be coming open in a year or two. Um, and so I positioned myself in, inside the institution to be able to be ready for it. Um, I became general counsel to that uh, agency. Um, and eventually, actually, I wrote the legislative package that made that state agency a full university campus. I stayed for 10 years. Wow, thank you for that. Um, but a house fire was the triggering <laughs> moment. That's interesting. You know, you, you, you never know what life is going to throw you in. And I think the key, and when you hear different people's stories, is what's your next right move? Right. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you. Uh, Andrew, tell us a little bit about your path. Well, uh, out of law school, I came here to Baltimore to clerk for a federal judge. Um, went to a, a big law firm here in town for about five or six years. Uh, and then uh, took a job with uh, Crown Central Petroleum Corporation in-house. Um, at the time, Crown was a, a refiner and a retailer, uh, operated gas stations and convenience stores. Uh, and was there for about 25 years. We eventually sold off all of those assets and the parent company, which is my current employer, Rosemore Inc., so family owned company, uh, asked me to come up and be their general counsel when their general counsel retired. So I've been at Rosemore since uh, 2010. <clears throat> uh, I don't have a house fire, but the uh, uh, signal event in uh, sending me in house was the birth of my daughter, my first child. Uh, my wife and I were both working for big law firms here in town. And it was uh, getting to the point where we were fighting with each other over who was going to have to uh, stay, you know, go home with the kids so that the other could stay until midnight. 
Uh, so we both decided that this was not going to work out too well. Uh, I went in house, she went to the attorney general's office and from there she also went in house. Uh, so uh, nothing nearly as dramatic as a house fire. No, but still, uh, did you, was your background in oil and gas? And, and uh, I mean, how did you gravitate into that particular field of industry? Yeah, I had no, no experience whatsoever in oil and gas. Um, uh, what happened actually is that I had done some work at the law firm for what was then called the CNP Telephone Company of Maryland, <laughs> uh, before Bell Atlantic, before Verizon. Uh, and the in-house counsel that I worked with at CNP uh, called me up one day and said, hey, we've got an opening here. Would you like to apply? <clears throat> So I said, oh, okay, cobbled together a resume and uh, I sent it over to him, didn't work out. Um, uh, I didn't get the job, but the woman who did get the job, who was a woman that I had clerked with, uh, was friends with the then general counsel of Crown. Uh, so a couple of weeks later, I got a call from my same contact at CNP. He said, hey, I've heard there's an opening at Crown and you know, here's, here's what you can do. Um, since I had just prepared my resume, <clears throat> I was all ready to put it in an envelope and send it off to him. <clears throat> that was back in the day when we put things in envelopes and put stamps on them and mailed them. But uh, yeah, so. Uh, but I had no experience with uh, oil and gas and uh, refining, retailing. Um, the, the position that I took was mainly involving litigation, and that's what I did at the law firm. So that was the <clears throat> sort of hook that got me in. So we're going to give bonus points to anybody that puts in the chat section what CMP stands for, for those of us all <laughs> remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned the word Bell Atlantic to somebody uh, the other day, and they looked at me like I was just ancient, which I am. So, <laughs> but thank you. So, Natasha, you're now working for a private firm. You're with her, um, the Metro, um, McMillan Metro, PC in Potomac. And, the, but in the past, that you served General Counsel University of North Carolina System campus. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Wait, so, um, so once once I got into the university system as um, in house counsel, um, so I knew the industry side, if you would, the the education piece really well. Um, what I and I had some background in disability law, which helped me um, hone my employment law skills a little quicker. <laughs> um, but what I really learned was I was. Um, my my role was largely to create the business container for the educational practice of my colleagues, um, the uh, teachers, professors. Um, and so I developed a completely new portfolio of contracts, employment, administrative appeals um, for, you know, everything from um, uh, kind of federal, federal trade commission things, you know, anything that came over the transom it was a small enough campus that I had to figure out either how to do it myself, how to get help um, and, and make it happen. Um, from, it, it, that gave me an incredible amount of versatility. Um, it, it forced me to learn versatility after being very specialized at legal aid. Um, it also gave me the opportunity to be the uh, campus liaison to the university system as a whole. I had a dotted line relationship to um, the, uh, in North Carolina, the roles are reversed. Uh, what would be the equivalent of the chancellor of the University of North Carolina system? Um, I had a dotted line to his uh, general counsel. Um, that president happened to be Erskine Bowles at the time. Um, you may recall he's from North Carolina and after he left the White House and his tsunami relief work, um, he brought White House pace to the UNC system. So I, I had the opportunity to learn a lot really quickly. Um, I was also the uh, liaison to 
all different parts of state government, the state auditor's office, the retirement system, the state personnel office, um, the legislature itself, if there were ever constituent questions um, that went to the um, House uh, and senators uh, in the state legislature, their offices would call me to do constituent relationships. Um, and so when I was almost 40, um, I kind of had this, I had just had my third child. I had this epiphany that um, as much as I loved the work I was doing, if I didn't start my own business then, I never would. Um, and so I started a solo practice representing independent schools. Um, I marketed myself as doing outside general counsel work to schools. Um, and you know, think about, people often ask why do schools need a lawyer? Well, they are very large revenue-based nonprofits. Um, and I built a solo practice. I got licensed in DC and Maryland. I was able to use my connections to pick up some larger schools in this area. Um, and I eventually became in-house counsel again to one of those large schools in Potomac. Um, and then, um, you know, more, more life curveballs. Uh, quite frankly, my marriage was not doing well and I was um, traveling a lot back and forth from North Carolina to the DC area and I moved. Um, I knew that for this next, hopefully, you know, 15 or 20 years at the end of my career that private practice was the place I wanted to be. So, you know, the conception of about being an in-house counsel or, or general counsel for a university or, or firm, for me at least, is that you need to be a, a, you need to know everything. You need to know all areas of the law, uh, both employment, contract, you know, and, and uh, how much does the the system, the university, the corporation look to you for sort of not just being reactive to issues that come up, whether personnel related, EEOC, or you know, business contractual stuff, versus more proactive in how to how do we prevent sort of the types of liability that we might expect? Either of you. Yeah, well, that's a great question. We um, my experience has been when I joined Crown. Uh, we had four lawyers, uh, so there was some sort of expertise involved. Uh, the general counsel was sort of the expert in securities law and governance. Uh, we had at uh, one point an environmental specialist, uh, and uh, but it was still a department of only four lawyers um, that gradually shrunk down to one. <laughs> uh, so. But, you know, it's not the same as a law firm. You know, you can't walk down the hall and, you know, find an expert on intellectual property or human resources or whatever else might come up. Uh, I think the key to being in-house is knowing what you can do and knowing when you need to get help from outside counsel. Uh, the obviously as in-house counsel, you're expected to try and minimize out, outside counsel costs uh, to minimize the cost to the company. Uh, so you try and do as much as you can uh, in-house, uh, but you've got to realize what, what you know and what you don't know and when you need help to call in from the outside. Uh, right now, I'm a solo practitioner. There, you're speaking to the entire legal department uh, at Rosemore. <clears throat> I'm a, a general with no troops. Uh, so it's, you know, yeah, you got to be on top of a lot of different areas and try and uh, stay in touch with the ones that affect your industry. Sasha? I agree with all of that. Um, I think I want to say, um, I would actually rephrase the question just a bit. I think when you're in-house counsel, you really have to drive um, your role and your, um, your the legal function within your organization. Um, you, if you, the perspective that I have is not only are you a partner to different internal constituents or departments, if you will, 
um, but you really have to be fully integrated into the leadership and drive strategy for your organization. You know, you are, um, you have to be a peer. You don't want people to be afraid of coming to legal because then problems get hidden from you. Um, and depending on uh, where you are, um, you know, in a, in a campus type situation, um, employees see you day in and day out. They just don't make an appointment formally to meet with you the way clients in private practice do. They're always watching you. They, they know how you interact with um, people in the cafeteria. They know whether you are fully participating in the community and supporting the art department by coming to shows. They're supporting both the students and the faculty. Um, and that is, uh, I bring that up because if people feel comfortable with you, um, they know that you are adding value to what they're trying to do. Um, then you have a willing clientele and what is otherwise a captive audience. Um, I also want to say that um, picking up a little bit on, on Andrew's comments, you know, for all lawyers, but particularly with this captive audience, competence, preparation, and reliability are indispensable. Um, your reputation is still only as good as the, your, the last task you performed for someone. Um, and the third thing I would say is uh, it's really important to build client competencies, to view these clients, internal clients as long-term relationships. Um, if uh, leaders across the campus know that you are building their professional skills and their status, um, then they willingly partner with you. Um, and it also eases the workload, right? Because you have a partner um, they, you can work on tactics together from a multidisciplinary perspective. Um, and it, it ultimately eases the workload for you because you simply cannot do everything that comes over the transom. Right. And so, so I mean, that's a great perspective and I appreciate that. Um, but, but if someone is looking to kind of make a career change, and you know, you've done that, each of you in your own lives. What background, what should they be doing to prepare themselves, you know, to, to become general counsel or in-house counsel? Um, regard, you know, based on the industry, based on the, you know, the type of business, uh, whether it's an academic institution or a corporation like Rosemore in, uh, in a petroleum area, tell us a little bit of what you think a person should do to kind of prepare themselves whether they're with a firm now or, or they're looking to start a career in this path? Well, I, I would, I'll jump in here and say that uh, being in-house counsel can, it varies dramatically from one company to the next. Uh, as I say, I'm a solo practitioner in-house, uh, but there are companies like Exelon or Marriott that are, based here in, in, in Maryland uh, that have huge legal departments. Um, you know, the, in, in my particular industry, uh, you know, Crown Central was, was a, a peanut among giants. Uh, the Exxon legal department at one point was over 500 lawyers, you know, bigger than a lot of law firms. So uh, taking a job at a big company with a big legal department is probably going to be a different um, uh, career path than coming to a smaller company. Uh, in my case, as I mentioned before, uh, litigation was what brought me uh, in-house. Uh, so you, you, there's a lot of subject matter uh, type preparation for it. If you're an employment lawyer, I think almost every company needs uh, employment lawyers uh, in-house. Uh, if you have a specialty in litigation, you may or may not actually try cases when you come to a company. Uh, I tried a few when I first came to Crown since I had done that in private practice. Uh, but for the most part, I've been supervising litigation. Um, knowing having done it, made I, I think made it easier for me to supervise outside counsel. Uh, 
if I, there are very few companies that take lawyers in-house right out of law school. Uh, it's happened. I know some of my colleagues are, uh, have taken that path and they are terrific in-house counsel, but most companies are not willing to train new lawyers. Uh, they prefer to have law firms uh, do that work for them, <clears throat> uh, get them up to speed and then bring them in-house. Uh, so if you're in law school, your odds of getting an in-house job are not as good as if you've spent some time at a law firm uh, beforehand. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, but, you know, it depends on the company and it depends what sort of law that you're interested in practicing in-house. Okay. Natasha? Um I think the research is key. Um, if you identify what kinds of positions you're interested in and where they are, um, then you can make a game plan of, do you need to be more of a generalist? Do you need to be more of a specialist, um, both in substance and uh, the toolkit that you have, be it litigation or transactional work? Um, when I look around, I see more job openings for uh, people with backgrounds in uh, significant employment and contracting work. Um, and I think it's wise to always have um, two, possibly three uh, different areas of subject matter expertise. Um, if it never hurts to uh, be on the regulatory uh, side of the industry that you want to go into, um, you know, you just have to do the research and. Um, like I said, what's your next right move? Kind of don't lock yourself into one particular path. Um, the other thing that I think is really important in terms of preparation is positioning yourself as a thought leader um, and positioning yourself um, in your network as somebody who's extremely comfortable and confident navigating different situations, because I think that is what companies are looking for, uh, those soft skills if you will. Um, they don't want somebody who is kind of a policy wonk inside their own company. They want, they're, they tend to, the people who are hiring tend to be business people um, and they tend to place, place a lot of value on network. Yeah, I, I agree with Natasha on that one. You, you've got to be ready and willing to jump into new things. Uh, to, uh, I, I mean, the first thing you need to do when you start at a company is figure out you know, who does what and what the keys to the company's operations are. Uh, every company, and, and I'm going to include nonprofits in that, uh, has, you know, certain very important uh, clients, if you will. It, they're, they're, uh, uh, in the case of a retail operation, you know, you, you figure that, well, they, the company's customers, the retail customers are the ones who are important. Well, they are, but you, the company's also got a lot of partnerships uh, in the gas station business. You know, the, one of the keys to the company is the margin that you get on uh, the stuff you sell. So the, your vendors, your suppliers, uh, the companies that transport the products to your to your retail stores. All of these are, you know, you have to understand which are the important uh, uh, partners, which are the important customers and zero in on those. And, uh, you know, first thing I tried to do was to meet as many people as I could, uh, find out what they do, find out if I have a question about, you know, some aspect of accounting, who can I call in the accounting department to get a good answer uh, and to find out what, what makes the company tick? You know, uh, where is the money come from? Where is the, you know, where did it, do the donations come from? Uh, uh, and, you know, zero in on the, the aspects of law that affect those relationships. Now, are you given autonomy to select firms or um, lawyers to on outside when you're looking for outside issues that come up, whether it's 
uh, liability matter that you're not going to do in house. Andrew, you mentioned about you know in the beginning you did some litigation, but then not so much later. So, what are sort of uh, the philosophy that you look to for hiring outside counsel to handle in these different types of cases or matters that come up that maybe you don't have the expertise in house or perhaps the capacity to handle? So, um, in my experience, there, um, and I'll draw from kind of a, both public and not for profit institutions. Um, the kind of outside counsel that I was hiring most often was actually some kind of insurance defense counsel. Um, <laughs> and um, I was, you know, all of a sudden you flip from being the lawyer to being the client uh, and have to bring a, a different perspective uh, on how you're gonna manage things um, and how you're gonna manage people and messaging and strategy. Um, you, that also takes knowledge of, of your insurance contract and the ability to advocate with the insurer itself of choosing, even if the insurer has the right to appoint the counsel technically, um, that you're, you've got the right person on their panel. Um, if, you know, for some things um, that are more optional services around international, uh, around um, intellectual property um, or litigation that's not covered by insurance, um, then I relied mostly on my network um, to find a good fit for my client. Um, I will say as right now, I still serve as outside general counsel um, to a number of companies, um, both education and non-education. Um, and some of those clients, even though they have the right to insurance counsel, they continue to hire me based on relationship and expertise. Um, and then depending on where you are um, in certain public uh institutions like the North Carolina University system, I actually wasn't allowed to go out and hire counsel without permission from the attorney general's office. And most of the litigation for um, the university system is actually conducted by the attorney general's office. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't have a choice necessarily of who I got in the AG's office, um, but I certainly managed those relationships um, for continuity and getting the best service I could for my client. Yeah, I, I more or less have complete discretion in hiring outside counsel. Uh, as Natasha pointed out, the, you know, network is, is key. Uh, uh, there, uh, for litigation, for example, there's a national organization called DRI, uh, which is defense lawyers, civil defense lawyers. And I've been very active in DRI ever since uh, I started at the law firm. Uh, most of my litigation is not in Maryland, uh, so I rely on contacts through DRI, through other uh, companies in my industry. Well, you know, who do you use for X kind of case in California or Texas? Uh, and uh, it's, you know, there are companies that have formal, you know, requests for proposals from outside counsel. They have literally, you know, 20 page questionnaires for law firms to fill out, to get on their panel. Uh, I, I don't have the time or the ability to do that. So it's uh, much more of an ad hoc process. You, you raise an interesting uh, point though. I mean, let's say you have, you're licensed in Maryland, Natasha, you're in North Carolina, you got Maryland and DC licensures but you've got something that arises in another state that you're looking at. I mean, how do you deal with the ethical issue about the fine line? Are you practicing law in another jurisdiction, you know, versus being staying within the lane, within the ethical considerations that you have to take into place? Well, I'll, I'll jump in here. I, <clears throat> I, it's a good question. I, I would like to state for the record that I have never practiced law in any state other than <laughs> Maryland or the District of Columbia. <clears throat> uh, uh, but it, it came up, for example, we had a uh, dispute with uh, one of our vendors. Uh, the dispute called for arbitration. Uh, we decided on a neutral site. They were based out in California and so we decided on uh, having the arbitration in Chicago. 
So the first thing I did was I called up outside counsel that I was familiar with in Chicago and I said, can I do this myself? Is it okay for me to, to fly to Chicago and do this arbitration myself? Uh, and he looked into it a little bit and said, yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, of course, you should hire me too to help you out, <clears throat> which I did. Uh, but it's something you got to look into, especially, I mean, you can't appear in another, in, in a state court in another state where you're not admitted. That's, that's you know, an absolute. Uh, you can get admitted pro hoc vici under if you're so inclined. Uh, but I think that most of the uh, most of the law in this area is that as in-house counsel, as long as I am representing only my company, uh, I can perform the services here in Maryland and not be in violation of the laws of other states. Uh, <clears throat> so, so far I have not been uh, <clears throat> brought before any attorney grievance commission in any state. So <clears throat> I'm hoping- Don't I want can that to happen. happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, there's the, the whole issue. I know lawyers working from home, they may live in, you know, or gone to their home down in Florida or in Virginia or in, in the District of Columbia, and they're practicing, you know, they're actually doing work for their clients. And there was a whole issue that the ABA dealt with, and I know uh, uh, ethically about are you practicing in that state? You know, even though you're doing work in another state. So I, I think it's an interesting issue, especially now given the pandemic and people are just doing so much stuff remotely. So Natasha, did you want to add anything to this? Um, I, I think Andrew covered that question really well. Um, yeah. you know, I, I actually served on the Attorney Grievance Commission for the State Bar in North Carolina. Um, and the kinds of questions that came up around in-house counsel were often complaints where people didn't realize that there were slightly different rules for in-house counsel. And, uh, and they were often dismissed of fairly quickly um, once, once we got to the right, applying the correct rule to the situation. Um, I, uh, you know, I hesitate to simply uh, talk about something that I just read myself last week, but I think the position that's evolving right now um, uh, is that if you have traveled and are practice re practicing remotely, but are only holding yourself out as practicing in the state where you are actually licensed, then it doesn't matter where you are physically. Right, no, appreciate. We have a question from one of the folks that are watching. Um, how much do budget restrictions enter the decision to hire outside counsel? Um, Dana Williams says he knows some folks that do insurance defense work and they say some of the companies drive sort of a hard bargain. I'm assuming that that's, uh, keeping the fees down. He's probably referring to an uh, insurance company. Uh, the insurance companies are notorious for driving hard bargains uh, and putting these uh, amazing restrictions on their outside panel counsel. Uh, I, I think that budget is always a consideration. Um, you know, you, you are, for the most part, the legal department is a cost center. Uh, you're not bringing money into the company. Uh, I mean, in, in many cases you are, if you're collecting debts that are owed to the company, uh, if you're working on licensing uh, your intellectual property, sure, that brings money into the company. But for the most part, especially in litigation, you know, you are a cost center uh, and you've got to be very conscious about it. Uh, uh, outside counsel fees are certainly a consideration uh, when we go to outside counsel. Uh, you, you, there are some matters, you know, if somebody slips and falls on a college campus or a gas station, you're not going to uh, want a $1,500 an hour lawyer to uh, be working on that case for you. Um, so it's a judgment cause. You know, you've got to get the right lawyer uh, who's value priced for whatever it is you're looking for. Um, Cynthia Leppard, if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Um, yes, I think this question might be more for Natasha. Um, Andrew, if we 
has comment. Um, Natasha, I was interested in your moving back and forth between the private practice and general counsel to various entities and then going in house with one of them. Um, when you were outside, um, regarding malpractice insurance is my question, because when you're being outside general counsel, you're dealing with various issues, some of which could be of some significance and oh, yes. going to want to have malpractice insurance. Um, and it may even need to be quite a bit. And then when you go into, um, when you become in-house then, you're doing presumably pretty much the same thing for that one entity. Do you then not need the malpractice insurance anymore? In other words, is this a significant difference between right. being outside general counsel and being inside general counsel? Um. So um, you're, you're right. I, I did go from in-house full-time to part-time both or well, full, full-time private to part-time private and, and in-house and then back to in-house again and now 100% private. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, malpractice, um, you should never go bare ever, even if the rules of your particular jurisdiction don't require you to have malpractice insurance, I would say never go bare. Um, there are some malpractice insurers who do provide um, part-time coverage and the rates can drop significantly. Um, you have to be very, very careful in doing your application um, and updating your application at, at least year to year. But if you have a significant change mid-year um, that you do a supplementary application uh, to your insurer to make sure that you are, are covered um, the way you want to be. Um, there are always places on the malpractice insurance application where you can exclude um, activities that are not covered. For example, um, I'm a mediator, which isn't practicing law, so none of my mediation is uh, covered under my malpractice insurance. Um, sometimes you might serve on public boards um, and you want to list those that activity as not being included in your malpractice coverage. It may sound really basic, but just um, being clear on your details, which hat you're wearing um, and making it transparent to your insurance company is the most important thing to do. So when you were totally in-house with the mm -hmm. one entity, at that point, you were not requiring. You don't need malpractice insurance. You should be covered by the uh, company's DNO. And then- I, I will point out though, I'm sorry, uh, there, there is insurance called employed counsel insurance, which is basically malpractice insurance for inside counsel. I had never heard of it until, I don't know, about five or 10 years ago, our outside insurance broker said, uh, you know, maybe you should get this. And I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> uh, happy to have more insurance. Uh, and so our company does carry it. It's a pretty nominal cost, but uh, there may be areas where DNO coverage does, excludes uh, the activity of in-house counsel. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question, Cynthia. Um, let me just, we have about 15 minutes left. If folks have questions, feel free to put your name or, or ask your question in the chat um, and we'll have you an opportunity. We have a nice crowd to be able to do that. But let me ask this. I would be remiss if I don't ask about bar association activities and how that is helped you in your abilities to remain involved and, and you know, particularly, you know, selfishly, the Maryland State Bar, for example, how that's helped. Well, I, um, I've... I'm a recent trans... Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go, go ahead, Natasha. Okay. I, I will say I am a recent transplant to Maryland. I've been licensed here for a decade, but I just moved three years ago and launched this new private practice two years ago. Um, the Maryland State Bar has been my ticket to getting to know people um, and creating, frankly, a new digital presence. Um, and I, I, you know, you have to do these things. You have to make a plan um, to market yourself. And um, your word of mouth is still wonderful when you can get it. But um, most legal consumers and employers are really looking. They're they're judging your first digital appearance these days. And the Bar Association is a great way to put yourself out there. Um, I have um, I've gone to annual meetings. Um, 
that I guess there was one that happened before, after I moved before COVID started. Um, but I've taught CLE for um, the State Bar Association. Um, I'm uh, in person and um, virtually. Uh, I had, I, I reached out, I volunteered with the staff to do some writing for the State Bar Journal. And a year later, I, they tapped me. Um, actually, Mark, you might have been part of the tapping process. I don't know what happens behind the scenes, but um, I am chairing the editorial advisory board of the State Bar Journal. Um, and that's, uh, you know, there's personal marketing or professional marketing, if you will. But for me, um, I became a lawyer because I, I believe deeply um, that that legal process is important and then we serve the public. Um, and getting involved with the State Bar is one um, very impactful way um, for me to live out that value. Great, thank you, thank you. Andrew. Yeah, I've been a member of the MSBA, I guess for 30 some years now. Um, and it, it's a great way to interact with other people. Uh, from an in-house perspective, I, I think there's really only one segment of the MSBA that is focused on in-house counsel, and that is the, the business law section has a corporate counsel committee. Uh, I uh, was the chair of that committee for a while. Uh, I'm still on the, the section council, um, but it, for in-house counsel, it's a, uh, another way to get together and, and to network. Uh, I have also taught CLE, uh, including as recently as last week uh, for the MSBA. Uh, I would also point out that for in-house counsel, there is another bar association, which should be in addition to the MSBA, of course, uh, called the Association of Corporate Counsel. Uh, we have a Baltimore chapter, uh, I, and I've been the president of that Baltimore chapter, and I'm now the web content manager of the Baltimore chapter. Uh, so if you want some additional information about uh, ACC, uh, we have an accbaltimore.com, uh, which incidentally has job listings uh, for in-house counsel. I uh, can, there's a job positions or job listings tab on, on ACC. Uh, the MSBA is terrific, uh, but there are other organizations like DRI and ACC, uh, which can really help you out from an in-house counsel standpoint. I, I thank you and I appreciate that because um, it's, no one organization is the end all. And I think the combination, as you point out, Andrew, of enter, you know, the industry specific, organizational specific can help really for those folks that are um, really targeting a particular area that they wanna get into. And, I, and I, that you actually answered one of my other questions is for how do folks find out about in-house counsel positions? And uh, this organization sounds like with their job postings, uh, that's a great resource. Are there any other resources out there for folks that might be considering uh, looking at what's, out, what's available, whether general, in-house, or what have you? So nowadays, setting up um, uh, employment searches on both Google or Indeed or any of those large sites um, can be incredibly helpful. And you can make them broad, as broad or as targeted as you want them to be based on you know, geography type of company, um, you know, uh, full general counsel versus associate or assistant in house counsel. Um, there's a lot of variety that you can set up in your search query and then you will get postings. Um, sometimes you need to just monitor for a couple of months to see what's really out there um, and can help you focus. I think for every industry, there is some kind of specialty uh, industry, organization. Um, sometimes it's a legal organization. Sometimes it's a more general one. If you're, you know, um, if you're, if you're into commercial real estate, you know, there's a home builder builders association that, that lawyers can belong to as well. Um, if you're interested in higher education, the national association of college and university attorneys is a wonderful resource. Um, you can't necessarily get access to their, um, their member protected materials, but you can get access to their job postings. 
Um, so create, you know, what I'm saying is create your research plan. What are you interested in? Um, make a plan and go for it. Fantastic. Andrew? Anything? Yeah, um, there's, there are also uh, plenty of uh, headhunters, search firms that <clears throat> specialize in in-house counsel. Uh, we had a recent ACC Baltimore program uh, that uh, featured two uh, search firms that specialize in in-house counsel. Uh, I think one of them is Major Lindsay in Africa. The other is uh, Robert Half. Uh, that the video of that particular program is available on our website, <clears throat> which I happen to know because I put it there. Um, and you go to our uh, ACC Baltimore and, and click on program materials and uh, about an hour long program featuring uh, these uh, search companies telling you basically what the market is like, uh, obviously trying to sell their own services, but uh, they posted some, uh, uh, there are some materials from that program, you know, how to, how to interview remotely, how to interview by Zoom, uh, by phone, uh, uh, salary guides for in-house counsel, uh, uh, salary guides for partners at law firms. Uh, I try not to compare the two because <clears throat> make me uh, <clears throat> jealous, but uh, I, there, we've got some material there. Awesome. Well, we, we definitely want to be and continue to be relevant to um, all of our attorneys across the states, particularly those in general counsel and house counsel to make sure that we're putting on the programs and uh, providing the networking opportunities, Natasha, as you pointed out, and helping to educate our members for those who are looking for a career change, a change in path, or just maybe working with in-house counsel to uh, do specialized work, whether it's uh, uh, litigation defense or, or, or a particular um, uh, specialty that's maybe not, um, uh, you don't have, uh, readily available in your current uh, office with the in-house counsel. So just kind of on the final note here in the last few minutes that we have, is there any, what would you say are the biggest challenges facing companies, universities, organizations uh, today as it re relates to in-house counsel? Um, is the trend, and I mean that in a way of, are we finding that their organizations are downsizing and and saying it's cheaper to for us and less liability to hire outside counsel when we need them? Or are you seeing a trend in the opposite direction or is, has that changed in any way? Um, Andrew, let me ask you first and we'll, we'll finish it up with Natasha. Sure, uh, the answer to your question is yes. <clears throat> uh, and it's a little bit facetious, but uh, different companies are doing different things. Uh, there are, you know, companies that are thriving in today's environment. Uh, you know, the tech companies are probably hiring in-house counsel, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, there are companies that are struggling in today's market, and those are the companies that are downsizing. Uh, <clears throat> you know, working for a company, you are sub subject to the um, environment, the, the economic environment, of the company you work for. Uh, if you're, you know, was in the oil and gas business, still am to a certain extent, and it's a very volatile business. You know, it can be very profitable uh, and go from very profitable to very unprofitable in a matter of months. Uh, <clears throat> so companies are shrinking, they're growing. Uh, I think most companies struggle to find the great, the, the ideal point where uh, an in-house counsel is going to provide more value than hiring outside counsel. And they're not always going to get it right, uh, but I, you know, it's, it's a tension. It's, you know, we have somebody on staff, we got to pay that person's salary benefits and uh, you know, when, when things turn south, headcount is one of the things they look at. And as in-house counsel, you're not immune from that. Uh, so it re really depends on the company. 
Thank you, Natasha. Um, there is incredible variety um, in those those tensions between inside and outside counsel. Um, really, the question boils down to value and perceived value as much as it does to dollars and cents. Um, uh, accessibility and flexibility um, of their in-house counsel is something that I think clients tend to value greatly. Um, there's this myth out there that somehow in-house counsel are working you know, 40 hour weeks and they're done at five o'clock and that's not necessarily true anymore. Um, if you're perceived as somebody who is not fully invested in, in your organization, um, that probably won't bode well for you. Um, I think that, so I can speak to um, the biggest issues facing um, the universities and large school systems um, and public agencies um, is really uh, a combination of uh, budget, static headcounts, and ever increasing um, requirements for regulatory process um, and complexity. And they, it's, it's not, it's, let me say this. Um, I think lawyers are being, in public institutions are being faced more and more with how do we make the best of this situation um, rather than how do we necessarily do 100% of what is expected of us. Um, and because otherwise the, the workload is crushing. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the time for both Natasha and Andrew uh, and our all of our members up. Oh, we got one quick question. How do you convince a client that they need to hire in-house counsel uh, to address um, their mounting legal needs? That came in real quick from Angela Robinson. A few minutes, quick answer on that one. Make That's yourself indispensable, <laughs> <laughs> create trust and relationship, and then show them their cost savings. There you go. All right. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the keys to, to, to one of the uh, most popular ways to, to come in house is to do a great job for your client uh, in the law firm uh, and either subtly or directly convince them that you'd be a good fit inside. Uh, that's indirectly how I got my jobs. Excellent. Well, I'm glad, Angela, you got your question in. Uh, we appreciate that. I could tell you this, Natasha and Andrew are, are absolutely um, very accessible and they're very generous with their time and their ability to provide mentorship or answer questions uh, for folks. So we, you know, I hope I may, I'm not overstepping, but I know that they would welcome that. I really appreciate everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, those that are viewing um, that will be viewing at a later date. Remember about our upcoming coffee chats that we talked about uh, first Wednesday of each month, as well as our cooking connections program. Uh, on behalf of the Maryland State Bar Association, I want to again extend my thanks for your time and all of your sharing of your knowledge today with us, Natasha and Andrew. Thank you very much. We hope everyone has a great day and I'll see you soon. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mark. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone.